And so uh, I was like, uh, Amy was standing right there, and, you know, Lydia's in the bed. I said, now, I know that I look young, younger, but I'm actually the, the older one between the two. And, and the nurse was like, and Amy's just sitting there just, you know, giving me that look. <laughs> and so I, I just stay in the doghouse. <laughs> I will feel it. Yeah. Yeah. Who said yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice little comfortable carpet down there. Exactly. Uh, uh, my, my favorite was one time, this was when Lydia was probably about two, and I, I, I've probably shared this with y'all before, but uh, Dave and Sandy probably weren't here um, uh, when, uh, when I mentioned it before, but uh, we were at the doctor's office one time, and uh, Lydia had some really bad gas <laughs> and, 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 and so she passed gas very loudly in her diaper sounded like an explosion went off. and uh, with a straight face I looked right at Amy and I said was that you or the baby and the doctor was sitting there and the doctor was like I can't believe that man just said that <laughs> so there, there, there's a reason why they say that some people get extra rewards in heaven because of who they have to put up with on earth. And so that means that Amy's just like stashing them away. She, she definitely puts up with a lot on earth. All right. All right, Jonah chapter 3. How's your house come, your house hunting? Okay. Well, you know, I, I was uh, mentioning that to a couple of folks before class. Uh, we, uh, we found a house in uh, Virginia Beach. Um, it is definitely in the lifestyles of the rich and famous, and so we will be paying through the nose uh, to rent this, uh, but we did get approved for it. And so, uh, but it's very spacious and very accessible. So it's got like very large rooms and it's got, uh, you know, easy access for wheelchairs. And so, uh, you know, we're just gonna have to bubble Where is down. Um, I'll, I'll have to look it up for you after class. If Amy was here, she would know. Uh, it's, it's, it's way out in Virginia Beach. It's in the vicinity of Nemo Parkway, where the courthouse is right. in that area. Right. Wow. Uh, I can't remember the name of the, uh, of the road. You gave me the area. Uh, we, were, we were driving through this neighborhood, and we're like looking around, we're like, yeah, we don't belong here. I'm from West Virginia. We, we live in Boulder Holmes, where I come from. <laughs> and, and so uh, at any rate, uh, it'll, it'll, it'll take every ounce of my retirement check and VA disability to pay for it, I'm sure. And so, uh, Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. All right, so uh, forgive the redundancy, but we have every week we always have people that are coming and going, and so we don't take for granted. Come on. Hey, uh, is John with you also? Yep, he's okay. coming. Excellent. Parking Excellent. the car. Wow, this is probably, uh, we just about have almost everybody here today. This is the biggest Good. crowd we've had out on the win. That's great. <laughs> Amen. All right, so uh, as far as uh, an outline of Jonah, what have we been saying happened in chapter one? Jonah was protesting, right? God said, go preach to Nineveh. Jonah said, no way, Jose. <laughs> chapter two, of course, we know what happened. He gets swallowed by the whales, so then we find Jonah praying. Yeah, right thank you. Now in chapter three, preach. He's going to be preaching. Thank you, and then in chapter 4, he's going to be pouting. All right, so that's everything from uh, Jonah's perspective. From God's perspective, things are a little different. In chapter 1, we see God's providence. When Jonah got tossed out of that boat, he should have drowned. But the Bible says God had prepared a great fish to swallow him. And so we see God's providence. Uh, in chapter 2, we saw God's pardon. God's pardon. As far as when Jonah prayed and repented, the Bible says that God spoke to the fish, and the fish spit him out onto the land. And so we saw God's pardon. Here in chapter 3, we're going to witness God's power because we're going to see a city of 800,000 pagans come to repentance. And then finally in chapter 4, when we get there next week, we're going to see God's pleasure. God's pleasure. God's pleasure in this sense, the Bible says that God does not delight in the death of the wicked. The Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God's pleasure is for people to get saved. And so um, that's Jonah's perspective. That's God's perspective. And this week is where we are. 
chapter 3. So in chapter 2, if you look at the last verse of chapter 2, it says, And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Now bear in mind, he's been in that fish's belly for three days and three nights. And so he's been in all those digestive juices and in that salt water and so forth. So don't you know that when he gets spit up on that dry land, Jonah is a sight to see. Now Jonah, of course, uh, by ethnicity or race, was a Jew. He was a Hebrew. Jews are typically dark-complected, olive skin, you know, uh, dark hair, dark eyes, so forth. My guess is Jonah's probably whiter than a ghost. Probably looks like, like, a, like an albino person because those digestive juices have basically, he's been like an acid <laughs> digesting for three days and three nights. And so he's, uh, he's quite the sight to see, I'm sure. So it says in verse number one of chapter three that the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. Now come back to chapter 1 for a second. In chapter 1, it says that the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. All right. So notice the message is slightly different here in chapter 3. It says the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. In chapter 1, he said to cry against it. Here in chapter 2, he says to preach the preaching that I'm going to tell you. And so, preaching, therefore, oftentimes is crying against something. And so, preaching, very often, if it's biblical preaching, is negative. We live in an era of the power of positive thinking. Remember uh, uh, Norman Vincent Peale? The power of positive thinking, you know? Uh, and then uh, what was the fellow out there in uh, California that had the Crystal Cathedral? He's dead now. Shuler. Shuler, yeah, there you go. And so he, he was another one that was like, you know, uh, the power of positive thinking. Now, don't get me wrong. We all like to hear positive things. You know, uh, uh, Paul doesn't want to be told that he's dumb as bricks. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to be told that he's the sharpest tool in the shed. He's already been told to dumb as bricks. <laughs> <laughs> well, to, let, let me encourage you this week, Paul, by saying you're the sharpest tool in the shed. There you go. <laughs> do, do you feel edified? Do you feel lifted up now? I do. Amen. Praise <laughs> the Lord. He's learning. He's learning. He's learning. There you go. He's getting up at it now. So we all like to hear positive things. You know, uh, a, a lady that goes out and buys a new dress, she wants to be told she looks nice in that dress. But I, I've never understood why women like to trap men, though. You know, you know honey, do I look fat in this dress? No. <laughs> There's no right answer. You know? And it's a very unfair position that women put us in when they ask such questions. Because <laughs> if you say, no, you look great. Oh, you're just telling me that. You don't really mean it. You know? And then, uh, you know, if, if God forbid, if you said the other, well, <laughs> you better get a divorce attorney. <laughs> I, I, I saw a, a funny meme the other day. Oh, my goodness. I, I, I laughed and I showed it to Amy. She just rolled her eyes. It shows a woman sitting on the edge of the bed and she's staring off at the ceiling and she's basically got her hand like this to her husband and the husband's sitting on the other side of the bed and his gestures, you, you can tell he's kind of pleading with her. And, and, and the caption says, uh, uh, the woman is speaking and, and, and she says, I looked on the computer and your computer had a file called My Documents. You don't love me anymore. It would say our documents. I hate you. <laughs> well, anyone that knows anything about computers knows that they all come with a file and it's called my, my documents. documents. <laughs> but she was upset because it didn't say our documents. That's why I have an apple. Yeah, exactly. Because my it apple. just says documents. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, sir. It's like I was listening to this country western song the other day and it said that Said that, he said, this red dress brought me to my knees, but the black dress made me hard to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> so, we all want to hear positive things, but sometimes we need to hear negative things. Now, uh, take your Bible for a second and come over to um, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Keep your thumb there. We're going to come right back to Jonah. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Bible tells us this about preaching. 2 Timothy chapter 4. In verse number 1, Paul tells young Timothy, 
I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, or the living, the alive, and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Preach the word. Be instant in season, when you feel like it, out of season, mm -hmm. when you don't. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And notice three things there. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. Alright? Reprove. Positive or negative? Negative. Correct. Correct. You're being proved wrong. You're being yeah, correct. corrected. Yeah. Right? Uh, rebuked. Negative. 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 <laughs> and then finally, exhort. Positive. Positive. Encourage. So watch this. Bible preaching, if it's biblical, is two-thirds negative. That's right. And that's why most Bible-believing churches, not all, most Bible-believing churches are small. And the reason why they're small is because they preach the book. And if you preach the book like it's supposed to be preached, your preaching is about two-thirds negative, and this culture that we live in can't handle that. They have to hear positive things. And if you won't tell them positive things, they'll go to Dr. Joel Olstein down the road who will. You ever notice? Joel Olstein, uh, as big as this church seems, you could put this church in the uh, last several back rows of Joel Olstein's Coliseum. You know why? Because he's telling them all the things they want to hear. So look what it says here. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. Verse 3, for the time will come, I would submit unto you that the time has come, the time will come that they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers. Watch out for these guys that are always teachers. We need, we need preachers more than we need teachers. Not saying we don't need teachers. I enjoy teaching y'all. But we need preachers as much as we do teachers. Teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. And so Paul said the time will come. Well, 2,000 years later, I submit to you that the time has come. And so preaching, if it's biblical preaching, is probably more geared towards the negative side than it is the positive side, and that's because we're sinners that need to be corrected. And the problem is most of us have just enough arrogance and pride that we don't want to be corrected. That's right. And if a preacher stands up and meddles too much, it's okay if he's meddling with John's sins over there, but when he starts meddling in mine, you know, uh, it's okay when I can look around and say, yep, well, the preacher meant that for Paul. Yeah. He meant that one for Mark. And Barbara, everybody knows how wicked Barbara is. That's right. I hope she's listening. Yeah. Right. I, I hope Linda's listening because I know the Holy Spirit meant that for her. That carnal rascal. Yeah. Meanwhile, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit moves the preacher to say something that steps on my toes. Now, now hold on a second, preacher. You know I'm a big tither, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know how it works, right? But every once in a while, every single one of us needs to get taken out to the woodshed right. or get right. bent over the tree stone mm -hmm. and have ourselves raked over the coals because we're sinners and we need the correction. <laughs> I'm not saying that it's pleasant or it's fun, but sometimes it's necessary. Mm -hmm. So in chapter 1 of Jonah, God told Jonah to go cry against Nineveh. Now, who is Nineveh? This is the capital of the Assyrian Empire. This is a city of about 800,000 people. Uh, modern times, it'd probably be on the scale of, say, like a Cincinnati or a Detroit, as far as the size and scope, which in the ancient world was gigantic. You know, by our standards... Cincinnati's, you know, bigger than Norfolk, but it's not considered a big city. Uh, Detroit would be bigger than Norfolk, but it's not considered a big city. When we think big cities, we're thinking New York City, Los Angeles, and places like that. Houston, uh, maybe Chicago. Uh, we think of those as being large cities. But uh, in the grand scheme of things, uh, as we see in the text here, as we read down here, uh, 
Nineveh was so big that it took three days to transverse the city by foot because there wasn't Uber and taxis and things like that. Right. It, uh, it was shoe leather to pavement that got you to where you needed to be. And so uh, this was a good, a good sized city. But this city, he says, go cry against it. And that's the kind of preaching that God had called Jonah to do. Now notice it says, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. The second time. Why did it come a second time? He didn't because, listen the first time. Yeah, because he didn't listen the first time. Yeah. What do we learn from that, though? God gives us a second chance. God is the God of second chances. God is the God of second chances. Listen here. We've talked before. Was Jonah evil or bad for not wanting to preach to the Ninevites? No, no not at all. It'd be like God calling you and I to go preach to ISIS or the Taliban or Al-Qaeda you know, the 9-11 terrorists and all that. Uh, we wouldn't be too thrilled about that either. One, we'd be concerned about how we might be perceived by our fellow countrymen, that we might be considered traitors, you know, uh, you know unpatriotic. But on the other hand, uh, not only that, but these are people that have been vicious towards our people. They've killed our people. They've murdered our people. Why in the world would I want to go preach to them the unsearchable riches of Christ and have God have mercy on them? Because... As a sinner and as a human being, I can't understand the unfathomable love of God who's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everyone to be saved. The problem is not everyone wants to be saved. And so he's the God of second chances. We kind of get a glimpse of this in Matthew chapter 18. Uh, take your Bible for a moment come over to Matthew 18. You can always uh, count on that hothead Peter. <laughs> to, to really step in it. And so uh, here Peter steps in it again. You say you shouldn't be disrespectful to Peter. No, I, I love Peter. Right? Peter's one of my favorite bio, Bible characters because he, I, uh, he's the one that's the most like me. <laughs> and so I, I'm not mocking or making uh, you know, fun of Peter. Uh, uh, I'm relating to Peter. <laughs> and so uh, Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew chapter 18, look at verse uh, 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. All right, now we've got a CPA in the room. Yeah. <laughs> we've got to take advantage of your math skills, brother. Yeah. Yeah. Some of us were public right. school educated. We don't have any. Yeah. <laughs> what is seventy times seven? Four ninety. Four ninety. Now, I could have asked either of the two school teachers that are in the room also. They probably could have answered that as well. But we got a certified public account in the room, right? <laughs> well, right? I'm tired, so I don't know. Yeah, you're, 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 you done put all that stuff away, didn't you? <laughs> all right. So 490. So Peter says, um, how often should I forgive my, my brother? Because he's really checking me off. And, I'm, you know, I've already forgiven him six times. Is seven times good enough? Because <laughs> I'm not like giving one last shot here. Jesus says, no, I was saying you seven times. I say 70 times 7. Now, a real smart aleck would say 70 times 7, that's 490. So on 491, you're in trouble. <laughs> no, that's not what he's saying at all. He's showing the infinity of God's mercy and grace. Now, God's mercy and grace does have limits. Because when you take your last breath in this life, and you have your last heartbeat in this life, if you have rejected the love and the grace and the mercy of God, you're going to spend eternity apart from God in a place called hell. So God's grace and mercy does have limits. But here's the thing. The principle of the thing is this. God's not just the God of second chances. He's the God of third chances and fourth chances and fifth chances and sixth chances and so on and so on. And if you stop and think about that, especially if you've been saved for any length of time, I've been saved for about 31 years. Uh, listen here. God's had to forgive me a whole lot in 31 years. Let me tell you something. I got saved when I was 19. So I've been a Christian in my life longer than I was a lost person. And so God's forgiven me more since I've been saved than he ever had to before I got saved. You know, I used to have a, a, a friend in the ministry. He, uh, he was an evangelist. And now he's a, he's a pastor uh, in, uh, I think he's in Tennessee now. His name's uh, Phil Kidd. And Phil Kidd said one time, um, I could understand, or he said, I could almost understand why God would love me enough to save me. 
He says, the part I can't understand is why God would save me when he knew what a lousy Christian I was going to be afterwards. And that's the story of us all, if we're honest. Like, you know, we come in here and our clothes are pressed. And we got Some of us have ties wrapped around our necks and we've got our Sunday best. And we've got our, our Bibles tucked under our arms. And, you know, uh, you know, everything looks real good, doesn't it? But on the inside, it's kind of like what Jesus told the Pharisees. He said, you know what, you're like a bunch of whited sepulchers, and on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. You know, uh, a, a sepulcher, they, they, uh, a whited sepulcher, they would paint it on the outside. It would look very beautiful and very extravagant, and it looked very pleasing to the eyes. But on the inside was death and corruption. And that's how many of us are sometimes, if we're honest. I'm not saying we're like that all the time, but if we're honest... There are seasons we go through of life where we don't walk with the Lord like we're supposed to and we backslide on God. And sometimes everything looks great on the outside, but you and God know the difference on the inside. And so we need to be real with God so he can be real with us because if we'll be real with him, he's the God of second chances. And so it says, The word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it, the preaching that I bid thee. Now, notice uh, the importance of the word preaching here. You know, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, the Bible says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. You know, you've got certain denominations uh, that emphasize baptism as part of salvation. Uh, theologically, we call that baptismal regeneration. Of the belief that there's some magic property about the water that when you get dunked in the water somehow that makes you a Christian you'd be surprised how many mainstream Christian denominations believe that uh, the Church of Christ is is really known for that as far as being one that uh, emphasizes water baptism but uh, Paul said for Christ sent me not to baptize well that's a strange thing to say if baptism is part of salvation Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel then whatever the gospel is, baptism is not part of it. And we know what the gospel is. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. It's the death, <coughs> burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we get baptized as a consequence of having believed that gospel. I don't get baptized to get saved. I get baptized because I am saved. And so people like to get the cart before the horse. And so um, the Bible tells us that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God, 1 Corinthians 1.18. And so the preaching of the cross is the power of God unto salvation, but to this world it's foolishness. Uh, you guys uh, uh, you know, know my love uh, for street preaching and, and, and public ministry because it's one thing to come into this room and stand before a, a group of 20 or so folks that all love the Lord like I do, all believe in the Lord like I do, I can pretty much get up here and say whatever I want to, and as long as it lines up with that book, you're going to nod your head in agreement or say amen. Of course, if I say something against the book, you'll call me out, as you should, right? So uh, it's one thing to stand behind a pulpit, like tonight I'll be over at True Vine Baptist Church. And, uh, you know, I'm preaching through the Gospel of John over there, so tonight we'll be wrapping up chapter 13. Interesting chapter, because this is where Judas gets possessed by Satan himself. And so uh, I invite you to come out and check that out. If not, you can turn in, uh, tune into the Facebook Live broadcast. But tonight when I go to True Vine, I'm going to stand up behind a pulpit, and I'm going to have an audience in front of me that every single one of them believes like I believe, unless there's some visitor that I don't know about that God's going to bring in. And so it's very easy and very comfortable to stand in front of that crowd and say whatever the Lord leads me to say because I know they're going to be receptive to it because they love God like I love God. They want the truth like I want the truth. And I hope that we have a great time tonight. It's a different environment altogether when you go down to Grandy Street in downtown Norfolk and you climb up on that ledge right there by TCC facing MacArthur Center and let it rip. <laughs> People of Norfolk! The Bible says, and boom, 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 boom. And it's even more fun when you see people that you work with. <laughs> Drop past like, 
Why is John out there yelling at people? <laughs> that actually happened to me one time. A doctor I work with, he goes, did I see you out on the corner of such and such uh, the other day? I was like, yes, sir. He goes, yeah, I was, why were you out there yelling at people? I said, well, doc, I wasn't yelling at people. I was preaching the gospel and warning people to flee from the wrath to come and helping them to understand that salvation is found in Jesus Christ and that there's a hell, but the good news of the gospel is you don't have to go. He's like, okay, gotcha. <laughs> Jim Jones has passed away. <laughs> David Koresh. <laughs> now watch this. Street preaching in the 21st century, it's looked at as yeah. being radical. Yeah. There would be people in this church mm -hmm. that if they saw me downtown preaching, mm -hmm. they'd be like, hmm. I can't believe that guy's part of First Orphan. <laughs> Does Eric know about this? <laughs> Philip needs to go talk to that guy. And so, but watch this. Jonah, he's told to go cry against the city. We're going to find that he goes out and does what God tells him to do this time. Guess where he's preaching at? He's preaching in the middle of the streets. He, he, he's in the middle of all of it. He's down where the stuff is. Uh, he's not in some air-conditioned building with people sitting on padded pews with ambient sound and colors all around you to make you feel nice and comfortable and homey and all that stuff. Uh, you know, he's out there on a street corner in the capital city of Israel's deadliest enemy, and he's telling them to repent or God's going to wipe them out. He's not out there spreading love. He's warning them to flee from the wrath to come. And so, street preaching, public ministry. He says, Arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto them the preaching that I bid thee. You know, I, I told you about, uh, you know, First Peter, or excuse me, you know, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. Um, look over at um, Proverbs chapter 1 for a second. Proverbs chapter 1. How many of y'all read through the book of Proverbs every month? That's a great morning devotion. There's a, most of our months have 31 days. There's 31 chapters in Proverbs. And so if you don't have some other devotional that you go by, um, Proverbs, a chapter a day, will keep the devil away. Amen? <laughs> Proverbs chapter 1, look at this. Now here, wisdom is personified as an individual. And so in verse 20... It says, Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice where? In the streets. In the streets. Well, what else did I hear out there? Market. Markets. Public, public, public square. Public square. All right, so streets, markets, public square. This is not in the synagogue. This is not in the chapel. This is not in the church. This is out there in the open where everybody in public can see it and hear it. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates, in the city, she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity, and the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge? Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called, and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel, and with none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, <clears throat> and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. Woo! That's a scary one. Call upon the Lord while he is near, right? Seek ye the Lord, and he shall be found, right? They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated the knowledge, or hated knowledge, and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way, and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Now, that's a great street preaching message right there. And notice that last verse 
whoever hearkens unto me will be safe and dwell uh, uh, quietly from fear of evil. That's the only verse in there that's positive. Why? Because the first part of that sermon is reproving and rebuking, and then finally, some exhortation. That's the Bible format that Paul told us about in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now look over at uh, Isaiah 58. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 58. We're going to be coming here twice. Isaiah chapter 58. We're going to look at verse, uh, I guess, 1 to 3 this time. Isaiah chapter 58. Actually, verse 1 and 2. Verse 58. Or excuse me, chapter 58, verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. No microphone, no amplifier, no church building, no synagogue. Go out in public where the people are and lift up your voice like a trumpet. Verse 2, Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching the God. <clears throat> and so Proverbs 1 and then um, Isaiah 58 give us an example of what Jonah is doing here. So coming back to Jonah chapter 3, in Jonah 3.3 3, it says, So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. Now um, before we move on, I want to tell you something about preaching. When I took homiletics uh, uh, at the uh, undergraduate level way back in, uh, oh I guess it was... Uh, 1993-1994 uh, we used a textbook called The Preacher and His Preaching and the guy that wrote that was a fellow by the name of Alfred Gibbs and it's the best book on preaching that I've ever read. I'm sure there's other good ones out there that I just haven't read but of the ones I've read this is the best one I ever saw. They talked about how preaching, good preaching effective preaching, it does three things. It does three things because man has three parts. Man has a body, a soul, and a spirit. Okay? <clears throat> so good preaching is going to stimulate the intellect. Nobody relates to preaching that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Nobody relates to that. You know, uh, the Bible says that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them to believe. He did not choose foolish preaching. And the Lord knows there's enough foolish preaching going on out there for sure. So good preaching stimulates the intellect. It makes sense to the man and the man as far as his mind and his brain. Good preaching also does this. It stirs the emotions. Now, intellect is going to correspond to the body. Emotions is going to correspond to the spirit. And then finally, good preaching brings submission of the will. And that's going to correspond to the soul. Because the soul, that's your ego. That's the I am. That's who you are. You have a body. You have a spirit. You are a soul. Does that make sense? I'll say that again. You have a body. You have a spirit. You are a soul. The soul is that part of you that lives forever. It never dies. That soul will either be absent from the body and present with the Lord in heaven, or like that rich man we read about last week, that soul will be in hell, lifting up its eyes, being in torments. And it's all determined about what you do with Jesus Christ. But good preaching accomplishes those three things. It stimulates the intellect. It makes sense. It's rational. 
Um, it stirs the emotions to want to make some kind of decision. And then finally, it conquers the will and brings submission of the will <coughs> where the individual is willing to wave that white flag of surrender and bow before God and say, Lord, you're right and I'm wrong. Help me to be right through you. That's what good preaching does. And so uh, it exhorts, but it also reproves and rebukes, and it does those three things as well, and that corresponds to the three parts of man. So in chapter 3, verse 3, though, um, as we've already mentioned here, this city of Nineveh is a great city of three days' journey. And, and again, what that means is if you were to walk from one side to the other, it's going to take you about three days to do it. And that's assuming you're moving at a pace of where you're walking about 30 miles a day. So we're talking about traversing like 90 miles over three days. So it says that verse 4, Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. So in other words, he's entered the city borders, and he's walked about 30 miles in. And so he's walked about one day's journey in. And he cried and said, Yet 40 days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. He's not going in there preaching, Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells you so. <laughs> no, he's like, you got 40 days, and then you're done. God's wiping it off the map. Ironically, that doesn't happen. Why doesn't it happen? Because they repent. So watch this. God's determinate will was for that city to get wiped off the map and yet when they repented God turned from the wrath he intended to pour out now in the book of Nahum we know that it eventually did come my point is this notice how this is a death blow to Calvinism as far as predestination and things like that because God's plan was for 800,000 people to get wiped out. And God sends Jonah to tell them so. But then the free will of man puts a wrench in the sovereignty of God. And these fellas pull a fast one and actually respond to the preaching and get right with God. And so notice um, the mention of 40, though. All right, so... How many days did it rain during the flood of Noah? 40 days. 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, Moses is on Mount Sinai getting the law and the, uh, the, the stone tablets for 40 days. All right? Saul reigns over Israel 40 years. David reigns over Israel 40 years. Solomon reigns over Israel 40 years. You come to the New Testament, Jesus fasts for 40 days in the wilderness before the temptations of Satan. Um, you get to Acts chapter 7, it takes Moses' 120-year lifespan and breaks it down into three equal 40-year periods. So 40 has a very significant place in Scripture as far as being a number associated with judgment, with trial, and with testing. In Noah's day, certainly, uh, it was a sign of judgment because God flooded the earth, right? Um, as far as uh, uh, Moses, it was a sign of judgment because God gave the law, right? But you come over to the New Testament with Jesus fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, that's an example of trial and testing. So you can start in Genesis and work your all, all way all the way to Revelation, there's a special significance on the number 40 in Scripture as far as judgment, trial, and testing. And so, yet 40 days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. So what's 40 associated with here? Judgment. Judgment's come. And so he says, yet 40 days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God. What? A bunch of heathen Gentiles, a bunch of pagans, uh, you know, uh, offering up uh, you know their children for sacrifices and uh, just rank with sexual immorality as far as false gods and deities. Uh, these people believed God, so the people of Nineveh believed God. It's kind of like Abraham. Abraham, I know you're old. I know your wife's old. I know you don't have any kids. 
I'm going to give you a promised son, and I'm going to multiply your seed above the stars of heaven and above the sand on the seashore. Was Abraham's response? Really? Okay, Lord, I believe you. Really? You believe me? Yeah, well, you said so. That settles it. I mean, I know some people say, God said so. I believe it. That settles it. I know you had an unnecessary step. God said it. That settles it. If I'm smart, I'll believe it. <laughs> Amen. It's not God said it. I believe it. That settles it. It's God said it. That settles it. If you're smart, you better believe it. <laughs> and so Abraham's just smart enough to say, yeah, don't make any kind of sense to me. I mean, I'm older than dirt. I'm, I'm collecting Social Security. I'm hurting in places I didn't know I had places. I, uh, my, my Medicare is coming in, you know, my prescription refills and all that stuff. I'm like that fellow on the, on the commercial uh, needing uh, my diabetes supplies, wondering if my secondary insurance is going to pay for it. So uh, I hear what you're saying. You know, uh, Sarah, you know, she's already had the change of life, you know, uh, so uh, I don't see how she's going to have kids. But your God, and if you say so, <coughs> then that's what's going to happen. And so it says that Abraham believed God and he counted it unto him for righteousness. You get over in the New Testament, Acts 27, you know, uh, they're in the midst of a storm. They've been in a storm for two weeks. The ship is, is uh, you know, probably going to sink. There's no hope of them escaping what's going on. And Paul stands up in the midst of them and says, well, I told you so. <laughs> you guys should have listened to me. I warned you that we weren't supposed to make this trip, but don't worry. Tonight, the angel of God, who I belong to, has told me that God is going to save my life, and he's given me all the lives of everyone that's on this ship. And then Paul says, I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. I preached a sermon on that not, not, not too long ago. If you go to the YouTube channel, you'll find a sermon title that's called, I Believe God. And it was on that text from Acts 27. And so, Old Testament, we see Abraham against impossible odds. No rational way this could be true. He believed him anyway. Yet Paul in the New Testament, going through a, a, a tremendous trial of life where all hope seems lost, and he says, I believe God that it shall be told, or it shall be even as it was told. And so, notice what happens when people believe God. Good things always happen when people believe God. When sinners believe God, God delivers them and saves their never dying soul and gives them eternal life. When you and I as Christians believe God, then he gives us the peace that passes all understanding that sustains us through whatever trials of life we're called upon to go through. Good things always happen when people believe God. So the people of Nineveh believe God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. So the aristocrats, the, the princes and the dukes and the, the bishops and whoever else that was a, 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 you know, an uppity up there in society, they put on themselves sackcloth and ashes all the way down to the poorest person that maybe was a homeless person living on the street. Everybody got in on the act here. They all show this outward expression of repentance. And so um, it says, uh, verse 6, For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth and ashes. Now what we see here is leadership by example. Leadership by example. And we also see of how God is able to turn the hearts of the vilest of men. Um, look over at uh, Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. In Daniel chapter 4, we read about the wickedest Gentile king of antiquity, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is one of the greatest types of the Antichrist in the Bible, especially in chapter 2 with his image that he commands people to bow down to. In Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar gets full of himself, and God humbles him by giving him a psychosis that causes him to think he's a beast of the field for seven years. And he lives in the field as a beast for seven years. 
afterwards, God restores his, his reason uh, to him. And uh, look what it says, uh, verse uh, 36, Daniel chapter 4, verse 36. At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my Lord sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. There's the wickedest Gentile king that ever lived. One of the greatest types of the Antichrist you'll find in the Bible. And when you read those last couple verses there, I think you can make an argument that Nebuchadnezzar may have got saved. Now, I can't say it for sure, but uh, those are some very interesting passages there, right? Now, uh, come over to Proverbs chapter 21 and notice what it says here. Proverbs chapter 21. Most folks in this room probably were not big fans of Barack Obama. And it had nothing to do with the color of his skin. Everyone wants to use the race car to make it a racial yeah. issue. Because everyone here in our assembly here this morning in this room is white. And so if you're against Obama, it must be because you're black, or he's black, and, and you don't like black people or whatever else. Uh, no, I was against Obama because of his policies. Uh, Obama had basically the same policies as Bill Clinton, and I didn't like Bill Clinton either, and Bill Clinton's white as I am. <laughs> and so uh, it had nothing to do with race. It had everything to do with policies and uh, uh, ideology with regards to our Constitution. No, he was the first black president. Yeah, well, <laughs> so they say. <laughs> Listen here. Barack Obama promoted abortion on demand. I believe abortion is the murder of an innocent right. child. Amen. You know, um, Obama promoted uh, uh, same-sex marriage. Uh, I believe the marriage is between a man and a woman. You know, uh, that's how God uh, set it up. And so I wasn't against Obama because he was black. I was against Obama because he was against the things of God that God reveals in his word. But watch this. I dare say that most of us that are Christians that were against Obama probably did not pray for Obama like we should have. And it's pretty hypocritical of us now to pray for Trump, who probably agrees with us on some of those issues, more so than Obama did, when we didn't pray for Obama. Because look what happens when God gets involved with a king's heart. And I know a president's not a king, but it's, it's a similar type position. 21-1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water he turneth, turneth it whithersoever he will. The heart of any king or any president or any leader is in the hand of the Lord. And the Lord can divert that heart in whatever direction he wants. Now what's your responsibility and what's mine? What are we supposed to do? 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Here's our responsibility. And by the way, we need to put this in practice for our uh, wicked governor, Mr. North. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's a real piece of work, too. Yeah. You know, he, he's, he's written prescriptions for Lydia. You don't know that? What? No. Governor North, mm -hmm. he's a pediatric neurologist. Mm -hmm. Pediatric neurologist. Did y'all know that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Very prominent with CHKD mm -hmm. uh, before he became governor. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, he's not practicing medicine right now because he's the governor. But y'all remember how, how last year he came out and was advocating for abortion yeah. after the yeah. baby has been delivered? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You had yeah. a preemie that's in the NICU yeah. right now. If Northam had his way, your grandchild could have been put to death after your grandchild was born. Our daughter-in-law has witnessed just what you're talking about mm -hmm. in the NICU. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't doubt it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wouldn't doubt it a bit. She's been there. Mm-hmm. That's huh. that, that's terrible. Yeah. And so I'm not trying to get all political with you. And no, it's not not political. It's not because Northam's a Democrat. Oh, you just don't like Democrats. No, I'd be saying the same thing if he was a Republican. Yeah. Matter of fact, I'd be saying it louder if he was a Republican, uh, because of the fact that the Republicans are supposedly pro-life. Yeah. 
they claim to be pro-life to get votes, mm -hmm. and then when they get in office, they don't do anything about abortion once they get there. So they, they've been hoodwinking this for about 50 years now. <laughs> and so, uh, but look at uh, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for who? All men. All men. Every man. For kings, right, we don't have kings in America, do we? And for all that are in authority. Well, we may not have kings, but we do have those that are in authority, right? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. You know why you want to pray for Northam? Here's why you want to pray for Northam. Because Northam wants to take away guns in this state. He wants to destroy and overthrow the Second Amendment. What happens if Virginia does that? There will be a civil war. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There will be a civil war, and much blood will yeah. be shed if the government comes against a law abiding populace and tries to take the weapons of law abiding citizens. And so, you know why you need to pray for uh, uh, Northam? Because your very life and the lives of your family may depend on it. Because things are about to get really serious here in the Commonwealth mm -hmm. if he decides to try to take the weapons of those that are law-abiding citizens. Because you can say what you want to, um, Virginians ain't never been willing to give up their guns all the way back to the first revolution. <laughs> King George said, no weapons. And the colonists here in Virginia said, let me think about that. Okay, thought about it, no, not happening. Not happening. And not just here, but also Massachusetts and, and in other places. And he, even, he even declared that state of emergency. You know? Yes. Oh, yeah. a state, mean, that's a big thing to declare a state of emergency. And, and what happened a at the rally? peaceful gathering of people. And what happened at the rally? Not, not one thing. Nothing. nothing. They were peaceful. They, yeah, they even not one their, thing. I, I, they even picked up their own trash. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody was arrested. No, 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 not one, one person was arrested. One person. Well, one, one, one person. It was a lady. It's a lady because she wouldn't take the hood off her head or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, You're right. I, I, I did hear about that. And so, but watch this. Look, look at Antifa and all these left-wing protesters. When have they ever had a peaceable assembly like that? Never. Never. And so, uh, you've got some incentive to pray for your governor. One, because God told you to, and it wasn't an option. It was a commandment, so you're sinning against God if you don't do it. And two, the safety and welfare of your family may depend on it. He says, for kings and for all that are authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Uh, all the peace and godliness will go out the window if civil war breaks out. Yeah. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, watch it now, who will have all men, including Bill Clinton, Barack Hussein Obama, and Ralph Northam, <laughs> to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. You know, there's a, there's a radical pastor um, out in uh, Arizona, Tempe, Arizona. And most of y'all probably never heard of him, but his name is Stephen Anderson. And uh, Anderson pastors a church there in Tempe, which is in the Phoenix area. Um, and it's like a, a storefront church of about two or 300 people. It's, you know, it's a decent sized church, so it's not like super, super small, but obviously it's not as big as Earth in orbit. Well, this guy uh, uh, is known for several things. One, he, he got tased on the border because of his non-compliance with Border Patrol officials, and so you know, he made a YouTube video, and that was his claim to fame. But for some reason, uh, CNN decided to interview this guy, and he gets on CNN and, and, and brags about how he prays that Barack Obama dies and goes to hell, and he can't wait for Obama to burn in hell. And this is a Baptist pastor that said this stuff. He says it's impossible for homosexuals to get saved, that they are uh, of a reprobate mind, and they should all be put to death because there's no possibility of them getting saved. Mm. Um, he's been banned from entering the UK. He's been banned from South Africa. So his visa has restrictions about where he can even go because of all the hateful, uh, mean-spirited things that he says. And that doesn't even get into all the theological heresy he teaches that I'm not even going to spend time for. The problem, uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is this, is a fellow like that is not even saved. A fellow like that has never been born again. A fellow like that does not have the Spirit of God abiding in him. Because the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
God wants everybody to be saved. Uh, listen here. If Barack Obama got saved this afternoon, mm. it set off a party in heaven. Mm. You know why? Because the Bible says there's yeah. joy in the presence yeah. of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Mm. Same with Bill Clinton. Mm. Hey, oh, Hillary. I know Trump says she's crooked Hillary, and she's she's as crooked as a dog's hind leg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wasn't yet Trump too, you know. But so, but here's the thing: any of them people, just like any of us, yeah. when we got saved, it triggered a party in heaven. It'd be the same thing for any of them because God wants everybody to be saved. And so, when you hear people like Stephen Anderson, uh, it's shocking and shameful that. The guy even has five people in his church. I can't imagine why anyone would waste five minutes with such unbiblical, satanic preaching. But that just shows that Barnum uh, was right. There's a, there's a sucker born every minute. Yes, Paul? Well, you know what amazes me, though, thinking about this story, <clears throat> about Nineveh? What amazes me is that all were saved. Yeah. Right? All of them. 800,000 of them. But then how do you compare that to Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, you know, um, God told Abraham, if I can find 50 righteous people, I'll spare it. Right. Well, Abraham knows that there's not 50 righteous people there. That's what I'm saying. You know, we're talking about 45, 40, 30, 20. All. And we don't know what the, pop I don't, I don't know what yeah. the population was there. Finally gets down to 10. Yeah. And, and why did he stop at 10? Noah's family. Well, Lot, his wife, that's two. Yeah. Noah and his wife. They, they have two unmarried daughters, that's four. They have two married daughters, that's six. They have two son-in-laws, that's eight. And they have two sons, that's ten. You ever notice why Abraham stopped at ten? Because that covered his family. Abraham says, I'm going to pull a Noah. Yeah. Noah didn't get anybody else on that ark but his family. That's right. But he got his family. But like I say, so, what amazes me is that there weren't a few in Nineveh that didn't, and there wasn't more in Sodom and Gomorrah that would. You know what I'm saying? That's yeah. kind of... Well, you know, it's like, it's like uh, uh, Jesus, uh, when he was preaching to the Jews, he said, uh, Nineveh shall rise up against this generation because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, there's a greater than Jonah here right now. And you're not even, I'm the one that called Jonah. <laughs> I'm the one that gave Jonah his sermon. <laughs> and Nineveh listened to him, and I'm greater than Jonah, yet you won't listen to me. And so it's, it's no different in our time. Our, our culture is the same way. You know, it's kind of funny. We can look at the Bible and we can say, oh, man, shame, shame, shame. They should have known better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when we're guilty of the same stuff, mm -hmm. you know, here in 2020. And so uh, verse uh, 6, For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from, from him and covered him with sackcloth and satin ashes. That's why you pray for your leaders. <laughs> That's why you pray for them. Because their heart is in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it whithersoever he will. And who knows if they might be a Nebuchadnezzar or whoever this king of Nineveh was. You know, we're not told what the king's name is here. Um, and then notice uh, the sackcloth and ashes. Uh, sackcloth was like a burlap sack. <laughs> and ashes, they would put ashes on their head, on their, uh, uh, their, their heads. And uh, in that culture, that Middle Eastern culture, uh, they're much more visibly outspoken about their emotions uh, as far as visible displays. You know, you and I might be repentant about something, but we're not going to go put on a burlap sap, go sit out in the parking lot, and put ashes all over ourselves. That's just not part of our culture. That was part of their culture. That, and even the Jews, that's how they expressed remorse and regret and repentance. Verse 7, And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. And so uh, what we have uh, here uh, is a fast. Back in verse 5 it says, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast. Uh, notice here, the fast is defined for you. Uh, it's mentioned in verse 5, but it's defined for you in verse 7. Uh, a fast is no food, no water. Now, some folks, when they fast, they drink water. They just go without food. Uh, other folks do juice fasts, where they don't eat any solids. They just, like, put something in a blender and drink uh, juices and things like that. And so there's, there's different ways of fasting. But typically in the Bible, a true fast is no food, no water. <coughs> now, stop and think about this. Moses is up on the mountain of Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights getting the law. 
There's no water to drink. There's no food to eat. <coughs> How do you explain that? Well, he did provide manna. <laughs> there wasn't no manna there, though. Not then. The manna hadn't come yet. I'm talking back to the Israelites yeah. he provided. So. so watch this. What do we learn from that? When you're in the presence of God, you don't, need to eat. You don't have to eat or drink. He'll provide. He sustains you just being in his presence. Mm -hmm. And so Moses didn't need to eat or drink. So he goes 40 days, 40 nights. I've actually known a pastor. His name's Doug Fisher. Uh, he's a pastor of Lighthouse Baptist Church in uh, El Cajon, California, which is uh, just outside of uh, San Diego. And uh, I went to church there for two years uh, when we were stationed in California. And uh, he's done three 40-day fasts. And, uh, no water and food? Uh, water, but no food. He would drink water and black coffee. Because they said you can't go for so many yeah. days without water. Yeah, he, he had, yeah you, would die, you would die. That's, that's what's supernatural about what happened with Moses, because you can't go that long without water. You might survive that long without food, but you can't without water. And so uh, uh, when I saw him on his first fast, he came to preach for our church in South Carolina. And he looked like a little kid wearing his father's suit. Because <laughs> he had lost, so, literally, it looked like a little kid wearing his daddy's suit. That's how much weight he had lost. But uh, he's done it three times. One time was for his children. Another time was for his church. And the third time, I'm not sure. But it, it can be done. Now, as far as fasting, um, you know, some people cannot do it. And there are valid medical reasons. Like, for example, uh, if you're a diabetic and you have... Uh, ups and downs with your sugars and so forth, fasting can kill you. And so uh, someone that's got those types of health issues, uh, they should never fast apart from consulting with their doc a doctor first. But here's the thing. I want to submit to you that fasting is a very important part of the armor of God as far as the weapons of our warfare, and it's never even spoken about in churches these days. Yes, ma'am. Stan, you know, that runs the kitchen? Yeah. He, he does Daniel's fast first of every year. What is Daniel's fast? I've heard of that, but I don't know what it well, is. Well, I, I know he hasn't eaten now. Tonight is over. So mm -hmm. I was asking him yesterday what he plans to eat tonight. Because what we had that when I was uh, working in Lifeway, right. we had that book, The Daniel Fast, uh -huh. but I never looked at it. So I, I, I mean, know. all he eats is, is one or two kinds of vegetables. Okay. I think that's all he has. Oh, okay, like Daniel did in Daniel uh -huh. chapter exactly. one. Okay, uh -huh. yeah, okay, that, that that makes sense then. Yes, sir. But didn't prayer come into this thing about fasting? Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's not fasting, you know, by itself. It's the combination of, of fasting and prayer together. Okay. But what I'm saying though is it's Old Testament and New Testament, and yet you never. Uh, hey, raise your hand the last time you heard a sermon about fasting. I'll raise wait. your hand about the last time you heard a sermon about prayer. I've heard about prayer since I have fasting. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And so the, the two go together. But look, uh, fasting, uh, come back to uh, um, Isaiah 58. I, I told you we were going to go there twice. So we went there as an example of public ministry. But in that same chapter, fasting is addressed. And fasting is actually defined for us what it is. Uh, come to Isaiah 58. This time we're going to come to verse 3. When Jesus talked about fasting, when he said, when you fast, which is implying that, Right. No, that's a great point. And I, was, I want to go to that passage next, and we still will. But that's a great point. Jesus said, when ye fast. He did not say, if, if ye fast. But it was taught. When ye fast. It was expected. It was, it was taken for granted. It was taught. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's no longer taught. No longer taught. It, and it needs to be taught. And I think the reason why the church is weak and anemic and doesn't have the power of the church of old is because we've allowed ourselves to be robbed of one of the primary weapons of our warfare. You know, Paul says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty unto God, casting down imaginations and every high thought uh, that manifests itself against the will of God. I'm misquoting it there. But fasting is one of those weapons. Now look here at Isaiah 58.3. The Lord is speaking rhetorically here. And he says, Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? So do you see what fasting is? Fasting is the afflicting of your soul. If you want to find out how vile you are, fast. Deprive your body of what it's accustomed to having. Especially those carbohydrates and sugars and so forth. Oh, my soul. Let me tell you something. 
uh, you will find out how strong, how wicked, and how vile your flesh is when you fast. That's how I get when I miss one meal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Paul doesn't get hungry. He gets hangry. <laughs> he gets hangry. And so he says, uh, it, it's an affliction of the soul. Uh, now look what it says. Behold, in the day of your fast, ye find pleasure and exact all your labors. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate and smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul. Uh, is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? In other words, that uh, folks were doing it uh, uh, as, a, as a show. They're trying to put on a show, a, a spiritual pretense. Oh, look at me, I'm spiritual, I fast. Verse 6, is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, that ye break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? Hey, when you're fasting, the food you would have eaten, give it to someone who's less fortunate than you. And that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house when thou seest the naked, and thou cover him, and uh, that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. And so uh, there's a fast that's for show, and then there's a fast uh, that's uh, for God. Um, look over at uh, Matthew chapter 6. I want to look at the uh, reference that uh, Brother Mark made mention of. Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Matter of fact, Mark, won't you read it for us, brother? Uh, let's see. Um, chapter 6. Let's verse have, 16. Yeah, read verse uh, 16 uh, uh, through 18. 16 to 18. Uh, moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, Anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father which is in secret. And thy father which is in the secret shall reward thee openly. All right. So notice that goes right along with Isaiah 58. The difference between a fast that's done for spiritual pretense to draw attention to yourself, and a fast, a true fast that's an affliction of your soul to get burdens lifted by God. You want to get God's attention? You want to add some oomph to your prayer life? Try fasting. Now, of course, if you've got medical conditions and so forth, talk to your doctor first. But if there's no medical reason why you can't, you ought to. In the Bible, they did. Um, look over at, um, come over to uh, Matthew 17. Matthew 17. Now, you remember this story. Um, Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. <clears throat> Moses and Elijah appear to him and he's transfigured and uh, uh, the voice of God comes from heaven <clears throat> excuse me and says this is my beloved son you know hear ye him um, and so forth uh, but when they come down from the mount they encounter this verse uh, 9 17 9 and as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And I'll actually uh, I'll come a little further. Look at verse uh, 14. Verse 14 is for sake of time, because we're about to run over. Uh, and when they were come to the multitude, there came unto him a certain man, kneeling down to him, and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic. How many of y'all feel like you're raised a lunatic? <laughs> <laughs> what y'all's by? Uh, the King James says lunatic. What, what, what's some alternate readings here for you guys? What, what do you got, uh, Michael? Yeah, at least says seizures. Seizures. Seizures and suffering. Okay, seizures. Yeah. Anything besides seizures? Epileptic. Epileptic, okay. All right. I kind of like the King James because I've raised some lunatics. <laughs> <laughs> and sore <laughs> effects. For oftentimes he falleth into the fire and off into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Um, <coughs> notice, this isn't epilepsy or seizures. 
it's demonic possession. And so there's a big difference between a legitimate medical condition as far as epilepsy and then demonic possession. And so um, verse uh, 19, then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence into yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. And watch verse 21. Verse 21 says, How be it, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Now, I know some of you are looking at your Bible a little squirrely eyed. You know why? Because some of your Bibles don't have verse 21. Yeah. No, I don't either. Yeah. I don't have it. Yeah. Okay. So. That's that nearly inspired version. <laughs> All right. So right here, <clears throat> we have the TR, and then we have the CT. TR, Texas Receptus. That's the Greek text that the King James Bible comes from. Over here, you have the critical text, and that's where you get the NIV, the ESV, the CSB, the NASV, the NLT, uh, pretty much any modern English translation comes from the CT versus the TR. Now, the CT, that's the oldest manuscripts. The TR is the mo most voluminous. So of the 5,800 or so manuscripts that exist, the overwhelming majority bear witness to the TR, right? Um, where the oldest manuscripts differ from the TR, they are uh, supported by a minority <laughs> count. Scholars give credence to the CT over the TR <coughs> because it's the oldest. They believe it's the closest to the original manuscripts. So since it's the closest to the original manuscripts, it must be the most accurate. However, the other school of thought, and this is the school that I belong to, <coughs> believes that the sheer volume of the TR shows that this is what the church was using. And these are minority in number because nobody was using them. So the text that's most accurate to the original is the TR. So the reason why the King James has this verse, and many of your Bibles do not, is because your Greek text doesn't have the verse, therefore the translators can't translate what's not there. The King James has the verse because the KJV translators were able to translate the verse because it was in their text. So you can't translate what's not there. So the issue with the difference between the King James uh, and the modern translations very often has nothing to do with translation. It's not that you said it this way, but you said it another way. It's not a choice between how to say it. It's a choice between one set of Greek manuscripts has the verse, and another set of Greek manuscripts doesn't, and the ones that don't, you can't translate what's not there. Right? So that's why I believe, mm -hmm. and, and I'm in the distinct minority of First Baptist Norfolk. I'm in such a minority, it's a wonder they let me teach this class. <laughs> I believe the King James Bible is the perfect word of God in the English-speaking language. Mm -hmm. that it has no errors, no mistakes, and it's the final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Other versions may be good commentaries on the Bible, but the King James Bible is the Bible because it's the only one in English that's got all the verses. John, yes. Is it, oh, the New King James is that? A uh, New King James. Uh, yeah. Thank you for bringing that up, Harper. Because the New King James is based on the Texas Receptus. I haven't looked this far. Does anyone have the New King James? Have you got it? No, it does. Oh, uh, do you got verse twenty-one, Paul? W would you look and see if you've got Matthew seventeen twenty-one? <clears throat> I'm pretty sure the New King James is going to have it because uh, uh, it's based yeah, on the, the text New of Genesis. Okay, excellent. It does. So that's the difference. That's why when you read certain verses in the Bible, it's like, wow, mine doesn't say that. It doesn't say that because there's a difference in these Greek texts. Yes, sir. Maybe the CT came out of Alexander Egypt. It did. <laughs> And we don't even have time to get into that. <laughs> I can preach a whole sermon on that. <laughs> You're trying to stir up trouble now. <laughs> Maynard's trying to stir up trouble. So the, the reason why 
you know, uh, uh, your uh, Bibles don't have verse 21 is because of those textual differences. Now, here's the thing. I realize the King James sometimes can be a little harder to understand, the these and thous, the TH endings. I completely get that. But when a hillbilly from West Virginia like me can read it and understand it, with a little bit of practice and a little bit of prayer, you can too. And at least you'll have a Bible that has all the verses. And when you come across that verse that just you cannot figure out, do you know what I do? I've got that Bible app, and it has all the versions on it. A free Bible app that most of you have on your smartphones, it'll give you the uh, yeah, it'll give you the verse in any translation. So on those rare occasions where I come to a verse in King James, uh, I'm not bashful about referring to another translation to see how they word it, to see if I can get uh, some meaning from it. But I'm sticking with the King James as far as my main Bible because I know it's got all the verses in it, and some of these other versions don't. So okay. what? So what do those verses do? They just they go from they skip from the one verse to the next. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it says yeah. Uh, so uh, verse nineteen, 20. verse twenty, verse twenty-two. Twenty-one is not even there. Right. Now some of them, some of them will put a footnote, yeah. and they'll put the verse at the bottom, yeah. and so they will at least let you know in a footnote that they took the verse out. Some of them don't even do that. Though. The ASV yes, of nineteen oh one put the footnote in. Yes, and uh, the new ASV puts brackets. Like, so if you look at the New American Standard, that verse might be in the New American Standard, but it's going to be in brackets indicating that they don't believe it was in, uh, in the original. So uh, at any rate, so the point is this, though. Jesus said this kind doesn't come out but by prayer and fasting. Notice prayer and fasting. And so uh, we're running out of time here, but if you look on your own time, Acts 13, when Paul and the other uh, teachers are at the church of Antioch, when the Holy Ghost sets Paul and Barnabas apart for the first missionary journey, it says, as they fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work that I have called them to. And so the church in Acts chapter 13 was practicing fasting. You come over to uh, 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul says that he fasted often. And so there's the apostle to the Gentiles. There's our apostle. Fast it off. And so fasting, uh, very much a part uh, of, of the Christian's uh, uh, weapons of, uh, of spirituality. All right, so we've got to wrap things up here. Um, come back to Jonah 3 so we can close. Uh, Jonah 3, um, verse 8. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and cry mightily unto God, yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works and they, uh, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. All right, so real quick here as we close. Repentance. Every time it occurs in the Bible, every single time without fail. It's turning to something from something. Repentance is a U-turn. I was going this way. I do an about face. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> fell over. <laughs> My military shoes work better doing that than this does. Uh, easy soldier. Special on carpet. Uh, and you go this way. And so I was going that way. I did a U-turn. Now I'm going this way. That's what repentance is. And uh, we'll probably talk about that a little bit more next week, but we are clearly out of time right now. And so chapter 4 is pretty short anyway. It's only got 11 verses. And so uh, we'll uh, discuss repentance a little bit at the beginning of next class, and then we'll finish chapter 4. Uh, and then the following week, Lord willing, uh, we'll be starting our study of the book of Revelation. And so we'll be in Revelation chapter 1, uh, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after. Okay? All right, so we'll take a break right there. Uh, any questions this morning? Any comments? Yes, ma'am. So, you know, praying for um, all the evil people. I'm not going to mention names. Y'all, I'll be here. Well, and we don't because for the same reason Jonah didn't, because he didn't want to see them get saved. But when you think about it, if we pray for the ones that need it, and if they did get saved, how much of the evil would be gone from politics, yeah. from yeah. the ISIS people. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. How many people in the church do you think were praying for Saul of Tarsus 
prior to Acts chapter 9. Probably this gal was holding the garments of those that stoned Stephen. He's hauling people before magistrates. He's torturing them till they renounce Christ, even to the point of killing them. Yeah. I don't think too many people in the church were praying for Saul of Tarsus. But God took that guy and turned him into the greatest Christian that ever lived. So, yes, sir. Well, I, I think I'm right. Y'all understand or know more than I'm. But I, I think the woman that was sort of a leader in Roe versus Wade, mm -hmm. you know, for abortion, has turned and is now a leader for pro yes. life. She's actually but, dead now, but oh. uh, she died. But you're right, though. She did repent of her association with Roe versus Wade. Um, and she became a very strong pro-life advocate, and so you're so, so it can it can happen, and it can help us. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, Kanye West. Y'all heard about Kanye mm -hmm. West? Mm -hmm. Right. Now I'm not saying you should start listening to rap music. <laughs> <laughs> like I said before, the difference between rap and crap is crap has a C and rap doesn't. Other than that, they're both the same thing. <laughs> I'm just saying. Go ahead, shake your head, Betty. You know, you, you shouldn't be surprised by what comes out of my mouth these days. Uh, yeah, you know, poor <laughs> So, but you know, uh, uh, his album Jesus is King, I torture Amy with it because I get in the shower and I turn it up real loud on my, on, on my iPhone, and she's like, turn that off. And I just, you know, I just let it play until I get out of the shower, you know, ah. because and she knows I don't like that kind of music, but there's a 15-year-old kid that's still trapped inside the 50-year-old body, and if I know something gets under your skin, I'm probably going to tighten the screws until oh, oh, I get you to speak. You like me. So, uh, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> man, we never grow up, do we, brother? We, we never grow up. I just want to mature a little bit. <laughs> I told Amy, someday I'm going to grow up. Today's not looking good, and tomorrow's not looking promising either. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but Kanye West, though, he, he's made a profession of faith, and who knows if it's real or not. But here's a guy doing very, very blasphemous towards the Lord, and if he did get saved, Amen. That, that's, a, that's a remarkable transformation if he did get saved. I mean, yeah, time will tell. Well, and you know? he, can, he can reach people that we can. That we that. Right. Yeah, like we can. What are you saying? The white boys can't rap? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they can't jump. They can't jump. <laughs> there's, not too, there's not enough vanilla ices in the world. <laughs> Some can. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. And uh, uh, thank you so much for being here. What a wonderful turnout. Uh, this is uh, the largest participation we've had in a long time. Uh, our class has always been transitory as far as people coming and going. And so I, I think the Renos are about the only ones uh, that we're, uh, we're missing today. Becky. And so, Becky. Becky. Yeah, Becky. Where, where is Becky? Is she Florida. out there? Florida. Florida. Okay. Yeah, backsliding Becky. <laughs> Get two backsliding <laughs> back, and another one. Yeah, a different one backslide. You know. Does her parole officer know that she left the state? <laughs> <laughs> she going to be fine. He does now. He does now. <laughs> <laughs> she needs an ankle bracelet thing, you know. <laughs> All right, well, let's pray. Our Father and God, we just uh, thank you for your goodness and mercy and your love towards us. And Lord, thank you that we can laugh and joke and have a good time together and enjoy each other's company. And just, uh, uh, Lord, your word says that uh, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. And so uh, a good sense of humor can be very therapeutic. Uh, and so thank you, Lord, that we can enjoy our, our time together. But, Lord, thank you most of all that we can open up the bread of life and uh, have the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us and direct us uh, as we attempt to rightly divide the word of truth. And so, Lord, we thank you for the time we've spent in Jonah chapter 3 this week. We look forward to chapter 4 next week and finishing the book. And, Lord, just pray for uh, each member of our class. Uh, we're thankful that uh, David and Sandra were able to come and uh, be with us today. Lord, we just pray that you give them a safe journey when it's time for them to go back. And, uh, Lord, I haven't had a chance to see the prayer sheet as far as what's going on. Uh, on the prayer sheet, but Lord, whatever requests are there, uh, we just ask that you meet those and answer them according to your blessed will. And uh, Father, we just pray that you watch over us and protect us and guide us. And Lord, help us to be good witnesses for you this day and this week. And Lord, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You're dismissed. May the Lord bless you.